Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm currently at Victoria University. Um, I, I had about a decade um, uh, working in the trade union movement and was remarking to Kirsten that I have fond memories of this place for a variety of reasons and that for reasons of time I won't go into now, but uh, the PSA has been, uh, some of you may appreciate the reasons why, to Pukenga Hire Tikanga Mahi, a very important part of, of my uh, life and thank you for organising this. I also want to acknowledge today uh, those who have been before us and who have passed. Um, I know today there was a memorial service for Kate Clark and Kate was of this place. Um, so we um, we feel well Kate uh, as well. So um, I, I, I didn't appreciate that you had Sir Geoffrey uh, and Andrew Butler last time. So my starting observations take as the point of departure of their recent work. So that's that's rather helpful, but it may mean that I can flip through some of what I've got to say. And I haven't time tested myself on this. I do want to leave sufficient time for questions, comments uh, of each other, of me, or whatever. So um, if I start to speed up, uh, I apologise. Can you all hear me at the back? Yeah. Okay. If for some reason my voice starts to diminish, just you know, wave out and say, you know, you're, 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 you're diminishing or something like that. <laughs> so, um, of the Otatahi, uh, I'm from Christchurch. Christchurch is my Turing or Waiwai, that's, uh, that's where the heart is. I think probably will be to the point where I draw my final breath, so that's just to sort of say where I'm from. So, rather than go with PowerPoint, which as you know is the university lecturer's favourite friend, um, I've gone instead with uh, old school notes, um, speaking notes, uh, not something I normally do. It's a wee bit intimidating too because when you've got PowerPoint you can almost hide behind it, you can sort of point to something and then go to the other side of the room. But it's just these notes and I gather too there's a camera recording me there. So, I'm going to read this. So earlier this year, on the 11th of March, to be precise, I penned a letter to the editor of the Dominion Post. And towards the end of what I describe as a modest missive, I ventured the opinion that perhaps it was time to review the processes of appointment to key central agencies such as the State Services Commission and the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And I said in that letter, quote, confirmation of an appointment by Parliament following an appearance before a select committee would be an interesting first step. Uh, and you know, it's similar to the kind of confirmation hearings we see in other, in other jurisdictions. And I didn't know at that point that Geoffrey Palmer and Andrew Butler were jointly working on a book that would be published by Victoria Press, University Press, which as we know is a quality publisher of quality works, uh, entitled The Constitution of Aotearoa New Zealand. And as you know from, if you were here at the last session, that book was published in August. Uh, it is, in my assessment, a superb work and a timely one, and I commend it to anyone who has an interest in the integrity of government and governance in the public domain. Uh, and they call for a Royal Commission into the public service. They write of a public service, quote, beset with problems, end quote, of, quote, a lack of coordination, cooperation and communication, uh, end quote, quote, an absence of free and frank advice offered to ministers in recent years. I won't go on. You'll get the general tenor of their, their complaint. Uh, and they say, quote, we need to future-proof the New Zealand system of governance, and I note parenthetically that the authors use the word governance and not government, uh, and the many serious operational and policy failures of recent years, such as the Kitteridge report on the Government Communication Security Bureau, the Leaky Homes Saga, Nova Pay, and the Pike River disaster. These policy failures indicate that improvements uh, are needed. And some of you, I don't know where you are, where you work, but some of you may have had some personal engagement with, with, with some of those. They refer to the Westminster tradition, one that New Zealand was once characterised as embodying to a greater degree than any other system of government and governance and assert that the defining elements of this tradition can and should be embedded in the Constitution. Helpfully they provide us in that book with a draft of the Constitution. It's always really helpful to have that and you're probably aware of the fact now that there is a webpage you can go to. Uh, and uh, in that they, they, they identify those provisions that they would see being included in the Constitution. I'm not going to rehearse them now in detail because those of you who are here for for, for their contribution will know, but I'll, but I'll highlight just the last. I mean, it you know, they include promotion of merit. Um, the second one, I think, really important, the first duty of the public service must be to uphold the Constitution. I'll come back to that. The first duty of the public service must be to uphold the Constitution. They talk about free and frank advice. 
And I see the PSA has got right onto it, and they're badges with free, frank, and fearless advice. The public service must hold, uphold the concept of stewardship, uh, which was one of the positive uh, features of the 2013 amendments to the State Sector Act, the introduction of stewardship. And then they go on to say, and I think this is really quite interesting, that the State Services Commissioner who oversees the public service shall be appointed by Parliament and be independent from the government. Now the last of these is of particular interest given my earlier referred to modest missive, the letter to the editor of the Dominion Post. But I, hardly, I wholeheartedly endorse the other elements that Palmer and Butler identify. And I do so on the basis of experience and scholarship, uh, the latter spanning a period of 10 years research and publishing much of it with my close friend and colleague, Professor Richard Shaw from Mercy University. When I wrote that original letter on the 11th of March, I was reflecting on the respective roles of the executive and legislative branches in the oversight and stewardship of the public service. And we know that the State Services Commission is one of the three central agencies, and it is by definition part of the executive branch of government. Now, as some of you will know, in the intervening period between my letter and the publication of Palmer and Butler, uh, on the 24th of August, I published an op-ed on the Dominion Post, and it was given the title, A Case for Two Watchdogs, question marks. In it, I rehearsed the Westminster tradition and reaffirmed my previously stated view that, and the principles and practices it informs, these are vital for good governance uh, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And in part, one motivation in writing the piece was a Dominion Post editorial that in fact had raised concerns about the capacity of the public service to furnish free and frank advice. Some of you may recall that, that editorial that the uh, Dom Post. Let me, let me quote from uh, the piece that I, that I published in the op-ed. At present, all policy relating to the public service is the responsibility of the executive branch. That is, the politically neutral, professional and permanent central agencies with the State Services Commission at its centre. But if the role of the public service is to serve the people and the government of the day, then there may be a case for involving the legislative branch in an oversight role. We might say, well, that's a fairly modest kind of suggestion to put out there. Um, and this year we have seen the Office of the Ombudsman inquiring into serious matters involving the public service and questioning the manner in which central agencies, specifically the Commission, have discharged their responsibilities. It's worth asking, in my view, it was worth asking, it continues to be the case, whether an additional officer of Parliament in the form of a public service commissioner might add value in ensuring the public service is meeting its obligations. As the editorial noted, those obligations are to the citizens and communities of Aotearoa New Zealand, not just the government of the day. And I went on to say, by no means would a public service commissioner be a substitute for the State Services Commission. So we're looking at complementary roles here, one in the executive, one in the legislative branch. And I went on to cite a potential model in the Office of the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment. It means, uh, I said, that the commissioner can initiate inquiries into any matter where there may be adverse implications for the environment. And if you look at the corresponding public service commissioner, perhaps that person could initiate any inquiries into any matter uh, that might have adverse implications for the public service or for good governance. Might one expect that degree of independence from the State Services Commission? And there may be staff from the commission here today, in which case you're particularly welcome. Ideally, yes, but it has been, in my view, somewhat absent. Um, and on some matters, uh, one close to my own research interests, a, a decision of the Commissioner to produce a code of conduct for political staff, the Commissioner was told not to proceed uh, by uh, the Prime Minister's office and comply with that executive direction. Perhaps a system to ensure the public service retains the independence to discharge its constitutional obligations can be found through existing arrangements, but turning our minds to other avenues is a discussion we need to have even if it may be discomforting at times. And that's where my op-ed piece ended. Well, it clearly was discomforting for some. On the 30th of August, the State Services Commission penned a response entitled, Free and Frank Advice at the Heart of the Public Service. It starts as follows, and I quote, Six weeks into my new job as State Services Commissioner, I was somewhat surprised to read Dr. Eichbaum's opinion piece, quote, two watchdogs better than one. Clearly, Eichbaum has a jaded view of the past and an even more sceptical view of the future. The piece went on to rehearse that free and frank advice is central and to reassure, reassure us that in this respect, all is well. 
take comfort. I was disappointed at the response and, and the tone, leaving aside tonal qualities and, and the fact that there was a, to some degree a sort of blaming of the messenger. What disappointed me most was that the op-ed from the Commissioner failed to engage with what I was putting out there for public discussion, namely the role that the New Zealand Parliament might play. I think quite a legitimate issue to, to raise. I still believe that this is a conversation we should have, uh, and clearly so too to Palmer and Butler. And it's always nice to have the sort of support of people of the eminence of the Right Honourable Sir Geoffrey Palmer and Dr Andrew Butler. But I am pleased, I have to say, that publicly at least no one has accused them of being the unfortunate hostages of jaded or sceptical views, so far at least. Let me turn now to two themes that are directly related to the Constitution and to what I hope will be a serious evidence-based and future-focused conversation about the role of the public service and its relationship to state, government and society. And I want to take as my point of departure Palmer and Butler's second summary point, quoted again, the first duty of the public service must be to uphold the Constitution. I am not a lawyer, but I suspect if I was, I'd be emphasising two words, first and Constitution, perhaps three if we put duty in the mix. First, duty, Constitution. And let me provide a narrative, and it may be one which some of you are familiar with. On the 2nd of May 1982, the Argentine cruiser, the General Belgrano, was sunk in a torpedo attack by the British submarine, the HMS Conqueror, with the loss of 368 lives. So in that attack and the war that followed, over 1,000 Argentine and British lives were lost. Uh, and one month before the sinking of the Belgrano, um, the Argentine uh, armed forces had invaded and occupied the Falklands, or Las Malvinas, from the Argentinian point of view, and Britain had responded by sending a substantial naval task force to retake the island. Some of you may well recall the Falklands War. There were two separate controversies about the sinking of the General Belgrano. One was whether the sinking had been ordered after the United Kingdom government had been informed on a crucial <coughs> peace initiative being brokered by Peru. The other was whether the Belgrano really was a direct threat to the British Naval Task Force, whether it constituted a real and present threat to that task force. The attack on the Belgrano took place outside of a 200 mile exclusion zone that surrounded the Falkland Islands and it had been declared by the British government following the occupation. Now, the Belgrano was actually south of the exclusion zone uh, and it turned away. Uh, from the Falklands. But the Prime Minister nonetheless um, authorised the attack uh, and the vessel was sunk. And the attack was justified uh, on the basis that the ship had been sailing towards the Royal Navy Task Force and was within sight of the exhibition today. Now when inquiries were subsequently made about the sinking, Clive Ponting, a senior civil servant the Ministry of Defence, was commissioned to research the matter. And Ponting found evidence, incontrovertible evidence, that the Belgrano had in fact turned away from the exclusion zone and he advised his minister. That's what you do. That's what public servants do. You advise your ministers. Notwithstanding this advice, the Minister of Defence at the time chose to continue with the official line, including before the Parliament. The vessel was within the exclusion zone. It constituted a real and present threat. Now, Ponting anonymously forwarded his research uh, no doubt his briefings to the Minister to a Parliamentary Select Committee um, that had been convened to investigate the sinking of the General Belgrano. He was arrested, Ponting, and prosecuted before a jury under charges laid pursuant to the Official Secrets Act. His defence was that he had not revealed information publicly but to another part of government itself, namely the Parliament. He sought no personal gain. He hadn't sold the story, he hadn't taken it down Fleet Street. He sought instead the best interests of the state. Now the presiding judge instructed the jury that the interests of the state were determined wholly and completely by the government of the day. The interests of the state must mean that the interests of the government of the day to which the civil service was bound by a relationship of trust. The jury rejected this advice and acquitted Ponting. Uh, within hours of his release, the head of the British Civil Service, Sir Robert Armstrong, wrote to the heads of all government departments emphasising the neutrality of the civil service. He declared that civil servants are servants of the Crown. For all practical purposes, the Crown in this context means and is represented by the government of the day 
in the determination of policy, the civil servant has no constitutional responsibility or role distinct from that of ministers. One imagines that Sir Geoffrey and Andrew Butler would probably take a contrary view. And this is the somewhat infamous Armstrong memorandum that some of you may be familiar with. Ponding couched his actions in the context of a bargain and something that I'll return to in closing. He felt that one side of the bargain had been repudiated and on that basis he was justified in forwarding his information. And if I can quote Clyde Pinting, and I quote, all my instincts after 15 years in the civil service told me that my loyalty was to ministers in the department, but then I realised that ministers had broken their side of the bargain in attempting to evade their responsibilities to Parliament. And his actions have given rise to what we now know as the Ponting Principle. Some of you may have come across this principle in the past. If you haven't in the course of your public service career, then I'd have to say I'd be a wee bit worried. The Ponting Principle, and I quote, Loyalty to one's superiors is only provisional. Loyalty to the public interest and to the democratic process are the ultimate obligations of functionaries. And that ponting principle is captured in that way by the Australian academic uh, John Ewer. But John Ewer goes on to say it's not, not emphasised simply about personal conscience issues. The primary ethics question for public servants is not what is my personal preference as to this or that course of action, rather it is what is my duty or responsibility as a pu public official in relation to this or that course of action. It's not about personal conscience. The basic test, says John Ewer, uh, uh, professional ethics is not that of satisfying one's personal conscience, but of acting in such a way as to be able to justify the public trust placed in one. As assessed by some legitimate reviewer of official, and contact, official conduct, that could be a minister, a court, a review tribunal, an ombudsman, parliamentary committee, or even the media, and their capacity as testers of public information. So that's the first narrative. That's the first narrative. So now for the second and some concluding comments. Uh, this year, if my maths is right, is the 80th anniversary of what I think is a significant piece of legislation. So, over to you. A starter for 10. Any takers? Significant piece of legislation, 80th birthday. No, so we won't, we won't keep going, otherwise people watching this possibly on video will think something's gone wrong. It's been a, a screen freeze. So, on the 31st of July 1936, the Political Disabilities Removal Bill was introduced into the New Zealand Parliament, and it repealed Section 59 of the Finance Act 1932. And the legislation was the result of the then Prime Minister, Michael Joseph Savage's commitment to confer full political rights on public servants. Those of you who have maybe seen or even own a copy of Bert Ross' History of the PSA, Remedy for Prison Evils, will find reference to the pernicious provisions of the Finance Act 1932 on page 78. It's a, it's a very good read. And Roth notes that under this particular piece of legislation, no public servant was ever actually charged. Uh, but in 1931, a 24-year-old draftsman uh, and the provisions of the, uh, the, the act that I'm talking about made it unlawful for public servants to participate in political activity and made it unlawful for organisations representing public servants to contribute in any way to political debate uh, discourse. So Roth notes that no public servant was ever charged under the act, but in 1931 a 24-year-old draftsman in the Auckland Lands and Survey Department had asked the government candidate an embarrassing question regarding salary cuts. He had also cabled reports on the 1931 Auckland riots to sympathetic news media outlets in Australia. The young man, who had a wife and two young children, received a telegram from the Public Service Commissioner on the 30th of July, ordering him to transfer to New Plymouth. Now, now with all due respect to New Plymouth, I love the place. Um, there were issues. You know. uh, he declined. He was dismissed from the public service on the 8th of August and eventually, in 1935, he joined the Auckland Wardside Workers' Union. His name was Harold Barnes. He was known to his friends as Jock. Jock Barnes. So, the Political Disabilities Removal Act gave public servants the right to stand for Parliament with special leave of absence without pay and enabled any society of public servants or trade union to affiliate to a political party or to use its funds for the furtherance of political objects. And I really do think that the Act deserves a birthday party of some kind, it being the 80th year. 
I've included the second narrative as a prompt and perhaps to ask the question. Notwithstanding statutory rights, SSC guidance, much of which I think is absolutely superb and the like, whether the public service in 2016 enjoys the kind and quality of rights that Savage and his colleagues and indeed the PSA and the wider union movement were so keen to see restored 80 years ago. The law and codes of guidance are one thing, but what about culture and climate? 80 years ago we didn't have the social media that we have today. People actually talk to one another. Is the culture today enabling or constraining of the rights of public servants to be active in political life? And I should be clear in posing that question that I do believe that there are and there should be constraints. And I have no problem with the text of current SEC guidance. Uh, but even though I'm located in an ivory tower where I can give full vent to my jaded and sceptical instincts, I hear things. So to the present and some concluding comments, and thankfully we are going to have some time for Q&A and discussion. I talked earlier about a bargain, and in academic circles we talk of the public servant service bargain or bargains, and Palmer and Butler foreshadow codifying important elements of that bargain in the Constitution. Uh, Ponting acted as he did because he felt his political principles, P-A-L-S, were not honouring their side of a bargain, their side of the bargain to be accountable to the Parliament and to be truthful in being held to account by the Parliament uh, and to use the information, accurate information that they were provided with. And the essence of the New Zealand bargain, I think, would seem to include the following. Firstly, and in some respects these mirror the um, Palmer and Butler uh, recommendations. Public servants are appointed, should be appointed on merit. Secondly, ministers play no part in the employment of public servants. Chief executives have that responsibility. I will simply leave it to you to reflect on the extent to which that is the case in Wellington in 2016. Public servants have a duty to proffer advice that is responsive to the political and policy priorities of the government of the day and responsible in as much as that duty is also to proffer advice that the government needs to hear but may not want to hear. Free, frank and fearless advice. And comprehensive advice, tendered without fear of recrimination. Fourthly, ministers in the government of the day have to respect the fact that stewardship means that the public service has to have the capability to serve the government of the day and any future government, equally and without fear or favour. Fifthly, Ponting might have it that the government of the day, to whom the public service owes a duty, a public servant owes a duty of service, has the responsibility to govern according to the constitution, whether formal or conventional. And that willfully misleading a parliament might cause the public service bargain to be vacated. Certainly for Ponting, it was vacated. And finally, of course, the present variant of the public service bargain, in the main, says the public servants enjoy the same basic rights as their fellow citizens when it comes to participation in political and public life. Now, if indeed I have summarised the essential features of a bargain, the question is, and it's a question for you, are the terms of it being met and respected? So over to you on that one. Thank you.